Weiss Brat is with the Liberal Think Tank Centre for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, from where he joins me now. Mark, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, Thank you. These summits were first conceived to look at the state of the world economy. That's now what they're having to return to, of course. But what can the G8 possibly do about the price of oil? Well, they could do quite a bit. Uh, you know, part of what's driving the price of oil up is uh, are the conflicts in the Middle East, the uh, occupation of Iraq, and the threats that the United States, together with uh, Europe, are, are making against Iran. And now you have, you know, recently Israel having maneuvers. Of course, Israel can't attack uh, Iran without permission from the United States because they have to go through Iraqi airspace, which is controlled by the United States. So any kind of statements uh, from this group uh, saying they were pursuing a negotiated solution, especially there's a negotiated solution on the table right now uh, that Iran has put forward, uh, I think uh, would help defuse the situation there at least. Well, other analysts who we've spoken to, of course, uh, think that speculation on the oil markets may be to blame as well but whatever the causes of high oil prices they're affecting food costs i mean how likely is it that the leaders will be in a mood for charity rather than self-interest well the problem is uh they're just not living up to their commitments you know the united states in particular is uh spending 600 billion a year on its military, 150 billion on the Iraq war and 4 billion on aid to Africa. And the G8 uh, or G7 at least have committed to uh, trying to spend uh, 7 tenths of 1% of GDP uh, to meet the Millennium Development Goals, to help meet those goals, to get rid of extreme poverty, which is very possible. That would be about $100 billion for the United States. So you can see they're nowhere near living up to these uh, commitments at this time. Lots of other challenges to be addressed, amongst them the Zimbabwe issue, North Korea, and also Iran. I mean, after all, Tehran has uh, made a response which hasn't been made public yet about this plan offering it technology and negotiations if it suspends uranium enrichment. Uh, do you think there might be some interesting developments there, possibly? If so, what? Well, it's possible, but I, the thing that makes me pessimistic is that in May, the Iranian ambassador offered uh, publicly to consider a deal in which there would be an international consortium that would enrich uranium uh, in Iran and be controlled internationally. And you had uh, no real response from the United States or Europe. So I think they're still trying to rely on uh, threats, uh, sanctions, and those kind of things to try to uh, force Iran to unilaterally uh, suspend enriching uranium, which is going to be very difficult because uh, they believe it's uh, their right uh, under international law and it, it basically is. Mark Weisbrot, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Mark Weisbrot from the Centre for Economic and Policy Research in Washington. And of course there will be plenty of coverage here on BBC News of the G8 Summit in Japan over the next three days.